here. Three, two, one, go. Hello, hello. Ignacy Chivchik, Portal Games. And this is the pod father of gaming, Stephen Bonacore. Episode 175 of Board Games Insider is here. We're recording this on December 11th, 2020. Board Games Insider is a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. And Tom Vassell again acknowledges my importance in his life and the Dice Tower world. Today, I was given my very own Dice Guy, courtesy of Tom. I'll reveal it on the Podfather of Gaming Facebook page and my own personal page. You know, the, you know those little Dice Guys that all the people have there? Yes, I know. Yep. He gave me one today. I was very proud. <laughs> he acknowledges me. <laughs> Few years ago, we would not believe that you will be part of the Dice Tower and you will be in the gang and that you will have your own little Dice Tower build. Never would I have believed this. Ever, ever, never. But there it is. How are you, sir? It's good to see you. Look, you look good today. And of course, people should be watching us too on our YouTube channel. But uh, you're looking good. You, your hair's a little longer, and yeah, uh, you're all like uh, warm in your hoodie there. I'm. I just finished recording my Polish vlog, so uh, I had to look amazing. So here I am. And you have to. And now you, um, you have to deal with. Uh, changing over to English, right? So that must be interesting uh, having to do that. Is it easy for you to like do like an hour in Polish and then go into English for an hour? It's so much easier to talk, uh, especially jokes. Like, like for a moment being serious, uh, and to come up with a joke in English is, is, <laughs> is not that easy. I'm doing leave, my best, sometimes it's pathetic, but... Leave the comedy to me, okay? That's, that's yeah. how we'll work this, all right. <laughs> well, tell me what's going on at Portal Games now. Uh, at Portal Games, of course, is a Christmas uh, time. I see it uh, very clearly in, in the office. The people are just finishing the tasks uh, they had this year. And basically, uh, most of the team is preparing to take a holiday break. So not many news from the office. Uh, just a reminder, PortalCon, the big event for all fans of Portal Games with our announcement of the new games on January 23rd. So uh, next year. and. Uh, let me use this uh, moment in the segment uh, for my very special mm, episode of a brag of the week segment <laughs> mm, because it's uh, it's something very very interesting happened this week and i want to share a story about that mm, it's 2001 ignace is young and rebellious and started a company and uh, loses money every single week because he cannot do business and he produces the role playing games that never are popular and uh, uh, we are on the break of bankruptcy. Like we are in a very, very bad situation. And I talked to my friend, Michael Orach, today famous designer. Michael, this is our last thing, uh, last job. Either it is successful, either we are out of the business, our last heist. And I designed with Michael to design and wrote a Neuroshima role-playing game. Today, very, very famous. And uh, because it was a huge task, uh, we decided to hire a young dude from Krakow, as even was in the Krakow, so here's a reference. A young dude from Krakow, uh, Marcin Blaha, and we, we tell him we are designing our role-playing game. We want you to help us be with us in the team. And the three of us in a four months window, only four months, we write and design the whole role-playing game, 600 pages. As everybody knows, it became the major hit in Poland. Uh, it becomes the most popular role-playing game in Poland. and uh, we don't go bankruptcy, we are successful. And uh, great story. Yeah, but this is just the beginning because three years later, 2005, 2005, Marcin Blaha, this young dude from Krakow, has a phone call. And the phone call is from Warsaw, from the small company in Warsaw that starts working on a video game called The Witcher 2. And they are looking for the writer, and they know Naroshima, they know that the game is amazing, they know him as a writer for us. And they offer him a job. So Martin comes to me and says, boss, I got a phone call from Warsaw. And they want me to write the stories for, for Witcher. What do you think? And I said, I think you go for it. I think uh, we are in a role playing game business. We will always have no money. We will always be passionate, but it makes no sense to stay with me. And take your girlfriend to Warsaw and, uh, and get the job uh, with Witcher. And he did. He left Portal Games. Uh, and he started to work on Witcher. And the whole story 
have a have a amazing ending this week because as probably everybody heard this week cyberpunk was released the biggest video game release of the of the year maybe wow. of the dec decade the statistics are insane and this very person this Martin Blaha is a, a lead uh, writer for the story he wrote this uh, story for the game uh, if you finish the whole game if you go to the credits page he's on the first spot he this is the wow. man who wrote the whole game uh, he made Witcher, then he made Witcher 3, and he became the, the most important person in the company in the CD Projekt Red for the, writing the story. And this week, I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud of me, Michael Oraj, and Martin Baha, these three dudes who, this 20 years ago, we were writing Naroshima role playing. Believe it or not, this is not fake. This is true. We were writing it in a basement, like with all these stupid stories of this people who were not successful at the beginning. We were in the basement because it was the cheapest location we had. We wrote this Naroshima role-playing game and all of us, three of us made amazing careers. Michael Oraj did, uh, of course, this amazing Kickstarters with Awakened Realms, Etherfield, Satan Grail. He became uh, this, uh, the man for the Kickstarter. I did my detective, Robinson Crusoe. I'm very happy as well. And Martin Blaha this week uh, celebrated the uh, creating the biggest video game of the of the of the year maybe of the decade that is a great story i did I not you, know anything about this this is very cool our listeners are now privy to something amazingly cool when i think let let think about this how it is possible that three of these people met in the one basement 20 years ago yeah what a coincidence and uh, this 20 years ago we did our careers in different directions but all of us super successful uh, so this week I'm super happy, super pumped. Uh, I saw Marcin uh, status on Facebook when he showed that he is in the credits as he designer of Cyberpunk. A super proud moment for me and all our friends. So fantastic. this was my brag of the week. That's a fantastic one, man. Oh, congratulations to him, to you, yep. to Michael, everybody. What a great, uh, what a great story that is. Thank you for sharing Thanks, that. Sir. Is there anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> that no, was pretty no, long, this, but no, that's okay. No, no, no. This this week, this I'm leaving cyberpunk because it is like an nice. amazing conclusion for for my beginning in the industry. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you again for sharing that. That's wonderful. Over here at the Podfather of Gaming, we're gonna talk Christmas gifts, holiday gifts. This podcast is gonna be dropping really like on the 16th of December. So. For your last, last minute moment, gifts. Last moment. Last moment. But for really great last moment gifts or things to do, please consider the things I've been talking about and some new stuff. First thing, of course, is the escape room. What a great holiday Christmas gift you can give to your family or your friends distanced is to play an escape room together. You can go over to escaperoomadventures.com. That's my escape room. And you can use the discount code Podfather Holiday, Podfather Holiday, and you'll get 20% off per person to play in the game. And you can just buy a gift certificate. Say you, you know what, you have no idea when you can play it. Maybe you just want to give it away. You want to give it away to your friend in, in Europe because, you know, you're not having seen them in a while. You didn't go to Essen. You can go there and you can buy I have a, a question. You have a question. Go ahead. I'm a user from Europe. Yes. How and this is a quite a serious question. Yeah. How much language dependent these escape rooms are? If you are talking about the person who is our listener from France or from Spain, and he may be, you know, afraid that he is afraid of language dependency. How much is, is this? There's definitely going to be some, but I mean, you know, language. But if they understand our our podcast, are they easy to play the podcast the, the game? Absolutely, hundred percent. You're not going to have to read Shakespeare. <laughs> which yeah. I can't even read, you know, that kind of thing. If you understand this podcast and you're getting it over here as a listener, you'll absolutely. So, you know, there could be something to read. It'll be a couple of lines, you know, and then you'd have to interpret that into what the next steps are and things. So absolutely. So again, escaperoomadventures.com. Use the discount code for 20% off Podfather, Podfather Holiday. You can give a gift certificate so somebody plays in the future or organize a game for Christmas Eve or maybe maybe later. Who knows if that's the good time, you know, after Christmas, you organize the game with your family so you can see them. Um, and of course, you know, team building exercises, we've been getting a lot of that for the holidays. A lot of people coming and saying, could I do a, a company wide thing, you know, in my, in my, my own business. I'm like, absolutely. So we'll do anything. And if you write directly to me, I'll get you some white glove service, meaning I'll hook you up with the operating partner and they'll make sure they take very special care of you. 
So reach out to me on that. But two other cool things, nice little Christmas gifts that you can buy for people. And these are not have anything to do with me whatsoever, but some very nice friends of mine sent me some stuff and I want to give them a shout out. The first one is Eric Arneson. Uh, great gamer. Uh, I see him at all the conventions, just a wonderful guy. And he's written a book and I'm showing it here on the YouTube channel right now, how to host a game night. So obviously we're not doing too many hostings of game nights right now. However, these things are going to be happening very soon. Great vaccine, great vaccine news, you know, by the first quarter, second quarter, we'll get to be seeing each other again. So Eric Arneson's how to host a game night. Great buy. Very inexpensive, nice paperback book. It gives a great little read of about uh, 150 pages. Yep, exactly like that. Uh, available on Amazon.com. I read it. It's. I wish I had this when I was doing my big game nights back in New Jersey. But maybe I will implement some of his ideas coming up when I get back to doing them here. And another little game that Mark Spector at the Grand Gaming Guild is a publishing company, a small one. Uh, he has published this little mini game. 18 card game called the Kringle caper. And it's like an escape room, like mini game. He does one of these each year. This one is holiday themed. What a great stocking stuffer. Look at that little thing there. It's only an 18 card little pack. And he promised me uh, that you can order this and he ships the next day. So for this, you can go to grandgamersguild.com. go to the store, go to the bottom list. You'll see the Kringle caper and it'll ship it to you. Great stocking stuffer and Eric Arneson's book, as I mentioned on available at amazon.com. Check them out. Awesome. Shout outs to my good buddies that send me little things like that. Very nice of them. I was considering that we have around 20,000 listeners this shipping next day, we can challenge him. If you yeah. all put order, order, I want to see him sending these 20,000 copies of that. That would be kind of funny. Very right. Anyway, this is like an $8, I think, $8, $10 little mini game. So check it out. Uh, the book, I, I didn't, I forgot the price, but um, very, I bet it's very inexpensive. Nice paperback book of about 150 pages. So check them out. Little shout outs for my buddies. Uh, and I think we should get over to the event deck. So Ignasi, you found a bunch of things that I um, I had not even put in here. Uh, I wasn't sure that they were important enough, but maybe they are. So the first one we have here is Asmodee unveils Unlock in a big box format. So let me read a little bit about this and then we can continue. Asmodee USA unveiled Unlock Secret Adventures, a new big box format for the Unlock series, which will release on January 8th. Unlock Secret Adventures is the first Unlock Escape Adventure game to come into U.S. trade in a new big box format. This game includes the three Secret Adventures released back in 2018, all in one box. Um, a No Side Story, Tombstone Express, and The Adventures of Oz, so obviously using a, a public domain IP there. So this is interesting. Uh, again, more of these escape room like games coming out asmodee coming into it in a in a big way now bringing it out anything else yeah, you the, the, yes yes the, and uh, i want to answer a question so spoiler alert i don't have an answer for this question the question is that uh, before uh, asmodee had a different packaging for european version of unlock and for uh, us version us had these small boxes so you are buying these uh, things separately and in Europe, like in Poland, you were buying these three packs, one big box. Uh, I never understood why they had this uh, different uh, approach because as we both know, it is at least it increases the cost of different packaging, packaging, right? Sure. But it was a uh, uh, overall decision in, uh, um, in America, we sell this product different way. And now the, the news comes that they adjusted situation and they are changing the product to the European one, to the big box uh, edition. So I don't know the answer. I don't know why they changed the decision, but I, I found it interesting that the, the data probably showed that mm, it is easier, better, I don't know, uh, for them to change the box. Yeah, I'm noticing that this, uh, this bigger box comes with a 10 card tutorial deck. So like probably like a mini way of explaining how mm -hmm. the game works. And then there's three adventures in there. Uh, for one to six players, by the way, plays in 60 minutes. And Very these cool. adventures previously were like a separate boosters. Sure. Um, I this, this obviously enables them to sell it at a higher price point, a higher price point, more profit in it in general, right? Every time I increase the price point of a game. Yeah, the question, why in the, at, the be, at the beginning, why there was not such a decision, right? Yeah. We don't know. Maybe they tested it 
purposely like this, or they simply Maybe. said, you know, you know, um, that the American market wanted smaller things. But as we know, Asmodee has consistently pushed, especially with their bigger games, pushed the price point higher. So this might be part of that strategy as well. It is an for interesting look, so we'll see. For, yeah, for sure. In the previous episodes, we were, we were talking that uh, after these first two or three years of Asmodee just buying this, this, this content, now they're evaluating, checking, mm -hmm. checking the numbers and adjusting, adjusting, adjusting. So this may be, uh, they look at the numbers and said, let's change it. Very interesting. So, are you interested in buying Watsi? <laughs> That's a great, uh, a great way of starting this. So, um, uh, noted uh, game store owner in the United States, Scott Thorne, uh, also um, uh, has a PhD uh, and he, uh, in marketing, uh, and he teaches at Southeast Missouri State University. He writes articles on ICV2. Uh, we have quoted some of his articles in the past, and one of the he, he wrote two recently um, regarding Hasbro potentially selling uh, Wizards of the Coast, and another one on selling Dungeons and Dragons off. So I did read these, and I said to myself, basically, he's just speculating. He was making a case for maybe it was going to happen. Um, I, I did I not it. agree with with the case, so that's why I didn't even bring it up. But Ignacy, let me hear what you what you have to say about the case for potentially. I brought it, yes, I brought it here because this is the this is the way for us to make full of us because now we can very clearly say <laughs> he's wrong. It makes he's, no sense. Nobody's buying Watsi, or we may say yes, it is possible. And then a year later, people will make fun of us that, that we try to be smart and we are right. wrong. In my opinion, it will not happen. Like this is ridiculous. Yes. For Hasbro okay. to sell what's it that is so good company and brings them so much revenue. Uh, but when I say it on tape, now I can be quoted and somebody may make fun of me two years later. So here we are. That's that's great. In fact, that's that is exactly my opinion. So so um, every we talk a lot about um, about Hasbro's profitability, right? I've I've quoted it. I've I've discussed the fact that they're so big and and they've got so much cash they could buy the entire industry, and in those like releases of earnings that they put out they they quote their their gaming stuff and their like hobby gaming as a separate item that it's so and they do they do put it like a lot with monopoly because they call it like their core ips sure monopoly is a core ip but they talk about magic the gathering they talk about dungeons and dragons these are hugely um usually profitable portions of their business could they sell it at a big premium and therefore be better for them? Maybe, but I just do not see it. I don't see anybody in the industry paying them enough money to take away those brands. Asmodee, for instance, if they were going to do it, I don't think that they even have the money to do it. Or if they did, that that would be something that they would even try to do. So I agree, not going to happen. We, we said it, it will not happen. <laughs> Check us <laughs> three years later. And then it's going to happen, right? And then we'll see what happens, right? So this is great. So we talked about um, this new crowdfunding platform specifically yep. for games called GameFound. Uh, and guess what? Awaken Realms, which does some very, very big Kickstarters, has placed their next big game on GameFound. And I think that they are actually... Am I, right, am I right in remembering this? They're actually a uh, part of GameFound. Is that right? They're, They're actually a owner, um, owner, owner, part owner, full owner, part full, owner, full, full owner. Oh, they own it. So it makes sense that they're certainly going to put their multi-million dollar um, kit next Kickstarter on here. So Ignasi, what, what do you know about this um, exactly? Yeah, so when we discussed the news that the game found wants to be a crowdfunding campaign uh, um, uh, site, we said it will be very difficult for them to find against Kickstarter and they need to bring a very powerful title to get attention for the gamers. Yep. And of course, what they are trying now to achieve is exactly that thing. The game in question, ISS Vanguard, is a game created by three designers. I will not 
uh, terrify you with Polish names, I will just quote <laughs> the games they designed. So these are designer of Etherfields, Tainted Grail, the biggest multi-million dollar uh, games that were super successful for Awaken Realm. So they did like a combo and this new game is designed by this combo of designers, like all of you who love Tainted Grail, all of you who loved Etherfields, this is the new game from this designer. So they are doing their best to bring attention for the gamers, to have these few million dollars on game found, and then show other creators, hey, this platform works, you can join us. So uh, at this point, I think they are doing what we expected from them. And uh, I still say what I said the last time, I keep fingers for them because I like when there's competition in the market. Absolutely. But I still think it will be very difficult to compete against Kickstarter. Uh, but as for now, they are doing these small steps forward as we predicted, I think. Very, very, very interesting development. I think that um, they'll be successful on this platform because of the pedigree of the game that you're talking about here. But um, the long term, it is going to be very hard to, to compete against against Kickstarter. So let's see what happens. All right, one more thing. We're going to talk about BGG support. Every year, uh, BGG runs a support drive, of course. And they push it harder at the end of the year because it's like your last time to support them for 2020 and get the badge that says that you've supported them. Um, and we want to just tell everybody, listen, do you use BGG? Of course you do. Is it important to you and get information and, 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 and have that community there? Yes, of course it is. So I implore you, and Ignacy, I'm sure, is, is going to say the same, please send them a little bit of money. That money could be five bucks or you could be enough to get the badge, I think, which is what, $15 to a copper badge and 25 for silver, et cetera. And, you know, they've, they've got a, they have a lot of people that they support, not only the community, but like, you know, people to run that website. Scott Alden, Aldi, amazing guy. He started this thing up way back when, when there was no such thing as a community and he created this huge online community. So if you can go over to Board Game Geek, go to their 2020 end of year support drive and, and support them to the best of your ability. I will, I will say it in a Slavic way. Uh, and I will remove, remove the part from Steven Santos that was, if you can, I believe that our listeners, yes. if you buy board games, you have these five bucks. So please uh, uh, support with five bucks or 10 bucks. You can buy one booster less. You can buy one expansion or less. Uh, on average, during a year, you use board game geek. Whatever you are looking for the file, whatever you are yep. looking for the rule book, whatever you have a rule question, you use this website. And if you do, please support them. I, as a publisher, of course, I love board game geek. They help me so much to reach audience. They help me so much to grow my company. So, of course, I, I, I am super loving this company, this company and this site. But you, as a user, be honest with you. Did you use this website this year? I guess you did. Yes, I think you can pay five bucks or 10 bucks, it is not a big deal. So support them. I fully, fully uh, encourage you to do that. Great, that's great. Let's move on to strategy and tactics. Benjamin Allen, who's at Pokey450 on Board Game Geek. I love listening to the show and have been listening <clears throat> almost since the beginning. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, for Steven, what gave you the idea for a space version of Survive? Very interesting, <laughs> very Easy to answer that question. Survive is a great game. Survive sells. And I love space. It was an obvious thing to project it into space. And Jeff Engelstein and family, Jeff, Sydney, who now runs part of the Stronghold Game catalog over at Indie Game Studios, Stronghold Games, and Brian Engelstein, the family, I went out to them and said, hey, guys, you do space games a lot. Well, you want to do this? They were like, Yes, we do. So that was the reason and why it was a good idea. And for Ignacy, would you do a space version of Robinson Crusoe? Kind of like how the Lost in Space TV show is a riff of that setting? You kind of did that, didn't you, on Mars? <laughs> I would. I want to be very diplomatic, so uh -oh. no comment. No comment? No comment. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> All right. For both of you, what is your earliest game you remember playing? Uh, his was uh, Disney Yahtzee when I was four to five years old. And thanks again. Keep it the good work. What's, Ignacy, do you remember the earliest game that you remember playing? 
Yeah, I, I remember because um, I wasn't uh, that young, uh, as, as he says, uh, in, of course, different different cultures, different countries. We had the Cold War, we had the Russians, uh, uh, so there was not many board games in stores. There was nothing in stores. <laughs> yeah, so, but when I was uh, older, uh, the first game I remember was Rumikup. Uh, this game with the numbers, yes, when you try to make sure. a set of the numbers. I played it a lot with my uh, grandmother. Uh, she brought it uh, in Germany and she brought it to to Poland and it was the only board game we had. Uh, and I absolutely loved this. And uh, late, like a few years ago, I bought the very copy, like the same edition I had in my childhood and I have it at home and I play with my wife Mary and I still love it. So the first game I remember from my childhood I still play it and I have the same edition I, I found on eBay or something like that. Very cool. And for me, I, I don't remember specifically the first game, but certainly I was playing all the mass market stuff. That's sort of what was available then. And I was young. So, I mean, Monopoly, I, I mean, I played that a lot when I was young. Um, some of those like really wild, I think they were Milton Bradley games. Um, I I played and I wish I still owned. There was a game called Voice of the Mummy. I might have even mentioned it here, where you know you were trying to go around and collect jewels and and get up higher and higher on the pyramid to get to the mummy's tomb. And I don't know how you even won the game, but the game spoke to you, which was really cool. Like you can open up the tomb and there was a a record player, like a I don't know. This is like a four inch record uh, what is that like eight centimeters uh something like that that was in there and then like when you did something you have to hit the the tomb of the mummy and then it would spin and it would say like have you tasted blood if so collect three jewels and it was like these odd things that they would ask you and then you would get jewels and you know take three steps back if you're Age is an even number, you know, crazy, silly things that this game would talk to you. I remember that one so well. I wish I had a copy of that game for the nostalgia factor of it. Restoration games, do you hear us? Yes, go make that one again. King Oil, probably something also I did. And I actually mentioned that on this podcast and somebody gave me a copy of King Oil oh, at like a convention. It was so nice. They just came to me and I heard you, you loved this game when you were young. Here it is. I'm giving it to you. <gasps> so nice. It's, still, awesome. it's on my shelf. Um, Ray Greenlee, big friend of the show. Ray is the one who does all of our intros, outros, this one in between. Awesome guy. He's at RM Green on Board Game Geek. When deciding to print an expansion, is there a consideration beyond the dollars in expected return? It seems like most games probably don't sell enough to make printing an expansion a good investment for a publisher from a pure dollars and cents perspective, but might customers be unhappy if a publisher is thought not to support the game? Would you print an expansion if you expect to only break even or lose a little on it? Ray, in general, doing anything that you're going to lose money on is just a bad idea, right? But when you print an expansion, you're doing it for two reasons. Obviously, you're bringing more content out and hopefully selling enough to, to make money. But you're also spurring on sales of the base game. So you just simply can't do an expansion for anything, especially a game that has not sold pretty darn well, or just even, you know, okay, you can't even consider doing an expansion. Uh, and then if, you know, once it gets to a certain level, you can do that expansion and hopefully you'll sell more of the base game and of course sell the expansion, but you're always going to print. I don't know if Ignacy has a rule of thumb. You're always going to print between 25% and 40%. That's the rule of thumb uh, of an expansion. The, 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 the print run of expansion will be significantly less. Less than half is really what it came down to, in my experience, of the original game. Of course, depending on popularity, et cetera. Yeah, this is exactly, exactly right. And with this rule of thumb, if the game is successful and you are releasing expansion because everybody's playing the game and they demand more, we go with the 40%. Uh, but if your game is sort of dead and you want to resurrect it and somehow help it, you print a small print run to not lose that much money. And you hope that somehow there'll be some bar, some hype, maybe the game will be better with the expansion. And as uh, Steven mentioned, it will move some base game and you will have yep. income from the base game. Uh, I had uh, both situation in my career. So I was releasing expansions to very successful games and they were selling like crazy. This year, 2020, we did reprinted expansions, which is a quite a rare situation that you have to reprint expansion. 
because because the cells are so well. And yes, I also had situation when I was designing to uh, publish expansion, knowing that it would be not very successful, but at least give some hype and press for the game that is moving very very slow. So uh, both both ways happens. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Amos, who's at Rochestfern96 on Board Game Geek. Hi, Ignacy and Steven. Recently, Antoine Bowser discussed improving his 10 year old design of Ghost Stories. Stream <laughs> That's such a hard game. Streamlining the rules and retheming it to give a similar but new experience. What are your thoughts on second editions of games? What would you decide if a game? How would you decide if a game should get a second edition? Ignacy, why don't you take that first? Yes, we discussed this a couple of times already, but of course the podcast is, uh, is uh, we recorded for many, many years already. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that second editions are awesome. Yep. I do believe that uh, you as a gamers need them. And uh, what I see is that the designer, let put the example of Ignacy. Ignacy five years ago had some talent, had some skills, and now five years later, I am better. Like I discovered new games, I discovered new mechanism, I got the feedback from the, play from the players, from the thousands of people playing this game. So five years later, I can look at this older design, I can find some mistakes, I can find the ways that I can improve it, and hence second edition. So I don't need to reprint the game that I see that it is a little bit old. I can make it better, faster, smoother, and provide to the market. So I'm a huge fan of second editions. I know this is a controversial topic and many people are complaining, why second edition? What's wrong with the first edition? Why you need to improve it? What you did wrong back, back then? Nothing wrong. I'm just better. I can do it even better today. So that's why I'm doing second edition. Yeah, and I, and I, and I find the controversy uh, how do I say this diplomatically and politely? I find it <laughs> silly. I find it silly. You have had the game for well, uh, five years. Let's just say use five years. You've had it for five years. You've enjoyed it for five years. You can continue. You can keep enjoying it for five, 10, a hundred more years. So if the designer and the publisher say we can even do something better, let's bring out a second, uh, a second edition or a third edition or a fourth edition. That's cool. You don't gotta buy it. Maybe your friend buys that one, and and you don't like it as much because it's possible, definitely possible. Yeah. But you don't have to just jump on that bandwagon if you know if you are enjoying this one and you don't want to change the rule sets in your head and things like that. So I have no, I have no issue with people doing second edition. Recently, I reported that I played Twilight Imperium fourth edition. There was a first. It was kind of crappy. There was yeah, a second. I, and, and me as a as a user, as a customer, right? I I am not interested in going to eBay and looking for the Twilight Stra Imperium second edition. No, I want the, the new one, the best one, the one that is the most of the development. So yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I I played the fourth edition. I liked it, but I'm not rushing out to get it. And I love the game. My third edition game still works it's great i don't play it even enough to think about now owning right when was the next time i'm gonna play i'm gonna i might play it again with 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 tom at some point which is where i played it he owns it he's keeping it in the library maybe that's the next time i play it so my third edition still works and if my buddy comes over my buddy chad he visits me from new jersey comes down here we break out twilight imperium we'll be playing third edition and it's cool and that works for me but designers Keep improving your games. It's it helps everybody if you improve games, improve skills, make things better. Let's move on. Matt Delling Delinger, he's Matt Delinger on BGG. Do you have a favorite funny podcast memory from the last one hundred or so episodes that you guys would like to share? Maybe something as well that occurred before or after the recording had started, huh? I we you and I have a like funny moments every time we we start the podcast, right? I'm always saying something ridiculous and getting you to laugh so you get a little less Slavic when we start this podcast. I'm trying to think, do we have like one particular funny moment of the podcast that you I, can have, remember? I have yes, I have one story to to share with you. But uh, what Steven said, basically every single week there is something silly happening. Uh, <laughs> 
behind the scenes or on on the fly so yeah this is like that's why we record because we just love to make some fun uh this this the story i can share is uh from the beginning of the podcast when we were recording and at some point my my iphone stopped recording so the last 50, <laughs> Yo, this last is a great one i know what you're gonna say go ahead so last 15 moment, minutes of the of the podcast were not recorded and because I didn't know Steven back then that well, I was ashamed to tell him that I lost I lost recording, and I re-recorded it once again. Um, he was talking uh, from his uh, voice, yes, from his uh, track, and I was post factum uh, saying again what I said during the podcast, and and nobody knew about that. Uh, so that was me recording podcast again, but only myself. So you had to figure out sort of how lo how long I, to speak. Yeah, exactly. in this I saw that this sentence i have 15 seconds for this sentence and i was saying this sentence for these 15 seconds did you ever tell did you ever tell our our engineer because maybe it might have even been gil hover back then now it's matthew oh yeah that was it, it was it was gil hover it was many years ago yeah, no i i didn't i didn't confess to anybody <laughs> you didn't confess it to anybody until you you did tell me though about it like years later i think that's hysterical um and my favorite memory in general is of this podcast is literally the, the moment that Ignacy asked me to do with him, um, which we've talked about already, uh, which was just great, you know, at BGG Con, sitting at one of the cool tables. I remember that we had a meeting at one of the. Um, Strong, about Stronghold. Yeah, about Stronghold, right? The game, um, the second edition and doing that together, but also we were sitting at one of those geek geek tables, you know, the, yep. the geek chic tables. And I, I just felt good. I was felt like I was in my office there. We're having a big po power, power meeting there. And you said, yes, let's do stronghold. Like that was like the two second meeting. Uh, Cause I was trying, trying to get you to, to allow me to do it. You said, yes, let's do it. And then you said, <laughs> and by the way, I want to do a podcast with you. I'm like, sounds like a good deal. Let's do this. So anyway, that was great. And, uh, Good stories, good stories today, but we got to move on. So let's get to our play testing segment. And I'm on time with my question. Yeah, barely. I saw you typing it as I was, <laughs> I gave you time to do it. <laughs> and uh, today I have, um, I think the phrase would be provocative question. I'm not sure if I'm using it right, mm, but sure. And we as a publishers, of course, we always say buy board games as a Christmas gift, uh, give board games to your family members, promote board games. Uh, and of course, this is what we publishers want to do. Uh, but in a fact, maybe it is not that great idea to give somebody a board game because maybe he doesn't or he or she doesn't want to read the rules. Maybe she or he can not read the rules. And maybe these games land on the shelf, uh, dusted in the, uh, covered in the dust and nobody's playing. And maybe this is a stupid uh, Christmas gift. So my question to our audience, we need the data, we need the voice from, of the people. Do you have a success story or unfortunately failure story about giving a board game as a Christmas gift? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think my answer, I, I, don't, I don't have a story. I don't have a story of, of yeah. either. I, don't, I certainly don't think that any... Uh, do, you, but do you give do you give a board game as a, as a, as a gift I to, to I, or you tend not to put these board games everywhere around you i've i've always during the stronghold days um i have uh given my younger um nephews not my nieces they were a little older so they you know they were the teenage plus at the time when i started stronghold so but my nephews uh were children you know young and uh, yeah, I would always give them something small from the catalog. You, know, you can't give them like terraforming Mars if they're like, you know, six years old and things like that. So I would always give them some of the smaller games. And in general, kids like games. So it always has gone, it has always gone well, but I don't have, I don't have a story that says like, and Oh my gosh, Uncle Steven just gave me something that he made. No, I think that they might have been too young to understand that I made the game too. So uh, yeah. no no major success or failure story. But this is a great question. I bet you we're going to hear some some really interesting ones. Uh, Ignacy, yes, how, about how about you? How about you? I have, a one, yeah, I have a one success story uh, and it was quite a random. I gave my uh, mother ticket to write because she played at my house once and she really liked that. Good. And I said, well, I will try. I bought her a ticket to write 
and it was absolutely great gift. She loved it. I saw the copy. It was so so played like it was almost destroyed. She played it so many times. Oh, so she excellent. loved that. Uh, but she didn't become a board gamer. Like this is not the case that she asked me about new games. Like this one ticket to ride somehow worked very well for her. She loved this experience. Uh, but then I followed up with the Carcassonne next year, and mm -hmm. I saw that she played just a few times, and uh, and but she didn't play many times. So. I have like a random success story, like right, the, right. Bring, bringing her to our hobby. So my question to our audience, did you brought somebody to our hobby or maybe opposite? Maybe you gave somebody <laughs> a board game and he was terrified of the rule book and said, no, no, I prefer PlayStation. One thing that I do know about uh, my family and board games, my, my brother who lives down, one of my brothers who lives down here in Florida now as well, uh, and some other friends, they're not board gamers at all. In fact, Anytime I mention it, it's always like, you know, get away from us, you know, that kind of that kind of thing. Um, but I've had success with two kinds of games with them, just like I'm bringing them over. And the success is either a party style game with like a gambling component, because my brother's a degenerate gambler, as well as his his friend and now my friend. They love gambling. So wits and wagers. That does really good. Another one that did really good is um, uh, Turf Master. I think I talked about that. I, we played that together during the Kentucky Derby yep. Uh, yep. time. You know, because you're you're not gambling, but it's a sporting thing, and and you're kind of gambling a little bit on it. Uh, and they also love Flam Rouge. It's a sporting thing that that has a racing component. So I now know how to target them with games just to play with them. They don't want them in their house, but if I want to play something with them, I know what to do. But this is interesting that the, you didn't create board gamer, but you were able to aim them yes. to their to their interests, what they love, and is this one game that will work for them, not all of the games, but this one yes. aimed nice. And they Perfect. specifically said to me, "Oh, my brother has." When I mentioned, "Hey, we you know we maybe can try a game where there's a is a cooperative cooperation involved. We're all trying to solve something to do it together." And he looked at me, and said, "Like, there's no winner." And I'm like, "No, no, no. We we work together to do it." He's like. You don't win the game? He, well, I said, we win together. He goes, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard, where we're going to work together, and now I'm not going to win. I'm not going to try to beat. I'm like, all right, we won't, we won't do that one. Okay. <laughs> so this is this is my family and my idiotic brother. So anyway. <laughs> anyway, so Ignasi right now is going to create yeah. a thread on Board Game I'm Geek. I see, I see him typing. He's going to create this thread, and we're you're going to go there. To our guild on Board Game Geek and find our play testing thread for this question. Do you have a success story or a failure story about giving a board game as a Christmas gift? And post your answer to that question for our play testing question of the week. And now we'll go to final scoring. Thank you so much for listening. Help us spread the word about this podcast by telling your friends to download Board Games Insider wherever they like to get their podcasts. To ask us questions for our strategy and tactics segment, you must post them in the correct thread in our guild on Board Game Geek. To answer our question to you from our playtesting segment, also go to our guild on Board Game Geek and look for the thread with this week's question. Board Games Insider has a Facebook page, so please like us on Facebook. Also on Facebook, please like Ignacy's page and Steven's page, which is slash Portal Publishing and slash Podfather Gaming. Our websites are portalgames.pl portalgamesus.com and podfathergaming.com. Please go there, sign up for the newsletters and get up to the minute information on what's happening at Portal Games and with the Podfather. On social media, you can also speak directly to Ignacy and Steven on Twitter at Portal Games US and at Podfather Gaming. Same on Instagram and on YouTube. The channel names are Portal Games Movies, Portal Games Gameplays and The Podfather of Gaming. Hope to see you in 2021. Convention season, very hopeful for this. I think it's going to happen. Board Games Insider was professionally edited by Matthew Jude from This Game is Broken podcast. If you'd like him to edit your podcast, please contact him on Twitter or email at thisgameisbrokenpodcast at gmail.com. Ignasi, we've come to the end. Anything special to say? Any news? I have a, I have a special invitation. Oh. Uh, Ma Matthew Jude, our oh. editor. He's awesome. He's just was our yes. Best. He was our guest at our Twitch channel, so you can see him playing one of the Portal games. Go to twitch.tv/portalgamesus. 
and you can see Matthew Jude, he's so fun and nice guy, so you can meet him uh, at least this virtual way, uh, because he does an amazing job for our podcast, but of course he's an amazing uh, influencer in our industry. So He is. Very sexy English accent too, doesn't he, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. yes. All you ladies out there love to listen to those English accents, <laughs> not not this horrible New York, Brooklyn style accent or Ignacy Slavic accent. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening and we'll see you in a week. Bye-bye. Bye.